The following program is brought to you by Caltech. So before I show the first slide, <clears throat> I'm going to start in the middle, not at the beginning or at the end. And I'm going to start on a serious note, and then we're going to go have a little bit of fun. So when I thought about preparing this talk, I wanted to come in and say some, some good words about Carver, some fitting words in, you know, in, in recognition of his 80th birthday. And I tried, and I tried, and I tried. And I couldn't come up with anything that I really liked. And so then I pulled up Gordon Moore's National Medal of Technology nominating statement. And I decided Gordon had done it better than me. So I'm going to read to you the last paragraph from Gordon Moore's nominating statement. Um, Gordon's not here, right? Good, because I didn't ask him in advance. <laughs> and this stuff's not public. <laughs> so it says, this is from Gordon, a clear pattern emerges from Carver's 40 years as an industry leader and a professor. From his invention of the gallium arsenide MESFET to deriving the limits of transistor scaling and the almost unlimited potential of silicon circuits, to the need for structured design methodologies and software-based silicon design, to neural networks and neuromorphic engineering, to the artificial silicon retina, to silicon chips that learn from experience, to an alternative formulation of freshman physics, one step leads to the next, each one a giant leap, one body of work providing him with the insight to conceive and tackle the next frontier, each one spawning entire industries or legions of researchers. Carver is a tireless leader, a role model, a risk taker, a visionary, a giant among mortals. I believe that's all true, Carver, and more. So now I'll say now a little bit about me. So I had, I um, was late 80s, and uh, I'd been out of school for a couple years. My wife was at, going to medical school, and I was working at the time. And I decided I really wanted to go back and get my PhD. And uh, I had an interest in neuroscience, and I had a background in circuit design. And one day I pulled up uh, the VLSI book, and I looked at chapter nine, the physics of computation. And that, I don't know if you, any of you remember that chapter nine. There's the whole VLSI stuff in the whole first part of the book, and then there's this one chapter at the end talking all about the physics of computation. And I read that chapter, and I thought, I think I'd like to go study for that guy. That, th th this, th this chapter is just wonderful. So I called up the lab, and I got Helen, and I called up again, and I got Helen, and I kept pestering Helen again and again and again, and finally she let me come and have a meeting with Carver. And so I came in and sat down with Carver, and we talked for a little bit about why I wanted to go back to grad school. And then and all of you have heard this story about the, the stairs, right? So Carver, then his eyes sort of lit up, and he said, come on, I'll take you to the lab. And he went bounding down the stairs like a kid about to open presents on Christmas Day. And I'm struggling to catch up, think, to catch up thinking, who is this guy? I mean, this, this is crazy. Why are we running to the lab? Um, but he was excited about everything in the lab. And that was, that was, that was, that was where things happened, was in the lab. And uh, so I got, I got admitted, thankfully enough. I was really excited. And um, you know, the first year came and went. Second year came and went. And I thought, hmm, I'm a, even though it was happy times, as you can see in this picture here of all the folks in the lab, I was thinking, you know, I feel like I'm failing. And I think I'm probably looking around the room to all of you who have been at Caltech by about the second year. We all think we're failing. Um, uh, just because we're struggling to come up with something we're going to innovate and something we're going to invent and something new. And, and it's hard. And so I especially felt that way after going back to school and being out for a while. I thought, well, I can, you know, I can, I can move ahead quickly. And it just was going slow. So one day I was in the VLSI class, and we were, doing the, uh, we were in the lab. And we were doing the, uh, the floating gate experiments, the tunneling and injection stuff. And at the end of the, the lab, everybody left. And I stayed around for a couple of minutes. And I thought, I wonder what happens if I wrap a little feedback loop around this floating gate. So I did that. I wrapped a fle feedback loop. And I got the floating gate to program to a, to a particular value. And with that feedback loop wrapped, wrapped around the floating gate, the, the characteristics of the feedback loop were kind of interesting. And there were some, there were some minor details. But it was kind of interesting. And I took the data. And I, um, I thought, I got to show this to Carver. So 
I saw him a couple of days later, and I said, Carver, I got some data to show you. And he pulls the plot out of my hand, and he says, explain, explain the data to me. I said, no, no, Carver, I got to explain the experiment. He said, no, 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 explain the data. I said, Carver, I got to explain the experiment first. And we had a debate back and forth, the plot sitting there on the table, about whether I would explain the experiment first or the data. So he finally conceded. I think that may be the only time. <laughs> and uh, I explained the experiment. And then I didn't even have to explain the data. When I explained the experiment, he looked at the plot, and he got that aha look in his eyes, as though, as though he's just discovered something fundamental in, about the universe, just this deep understanding. And uh, I know all of you have probably seen that aha look. It uh, doesn't come very often, but when you see it, it's just this wonderful look. And so I searched far and wide to find a picture of Carver with that aha look. Couldn't find anything. So finally, I asked Barb, and she sent me this wonderful picture, and here it is. <laughs> and that look is still there. Every once in a while, you'll see it. And it's that inquisitive look as though he's just discovered something. And that inquisitive look sums up Carver's approach to life. So after I did those experiments, I came to learn about Carver's love for silicon dioxide. Um, and it's just it's a known, wonderful, a known beautiful material, a wonderful material. And Carver, um, it's, you know, it's been a part of the work you've gone, done back to the early days. And we had lots of talks about silicon dioxide. And I know Carver's love for insulators, as I call them, extends uh, from thick to thin. Um, so we were doing, at that time, you know, experiments in a couple of hundred um, angstrom thick oxides. But here's a picture of the insulator wall that Carver's got, where you know, you've already heard about uh, him following uh, transmission lines and, and, and getting insulators and, and rebuilding them and, and, and polishing them up and making them look new. But we were really focused on, on the physics of, of thin oxides on silicon. So after I did that experiment and we did some more stuff, I said, OK, Carver, well, you know, where do you think we should go next? And Carver said, I think you should make a single transistor synapse. I said, what? He said, yeah, make a device where you can move the drain up and down, and it'll tunnel or inject. And, that w and if the input signal is weak, it'll, it, the floating gate will go down, on the tra and the transistor will effectively weaken. And if the input signal is large, the transistor will effectively s strengthen, and it'll look like a synapse. And for me, I thought, really? Is that what we're supposed to do? You know, that, that, that didn't seem like the best starting place, but I said, OK, Carver, we'll go build this thing. So sure enough. Um, I went and built it sort of reluctantly, and, and it worked. You know, It took a little bit of time, more time than I, I had thought it would. It took a little time. And wouldn't you know, the first paper we wrote on that, Brad and Jennifer and, and me, uh, won the best paper award for the Electron Devices Society for the year. So um, I'm score, chalk one up, another one up to Carver. But at the same time, Carver had said, when you instrument this floating gate, you're going to have to put circuitry to measure what's going on and use P-channel devices, PFETs or PMOSFETs, because everybody knows they don't inject. So we did this single transistor synapse stuff, and then we had these P-channel op amps and stuff. And sure enough, there was always this anomalous current. And I kept trying to figure out what it was, what it was, tease it apart, and I finally realized that those PFETs were doing something, that they were injecting electrons on that floating gate for that synapse transistor. And I was stumped, and Carver was even stumped, and, uh, and Jen actually looked at it and figured it out. And we coined, the, or actually he, or she coined the, the term, uh, impact ionized hot electron injection, or just impact injection for short. And that name will come up again in, in just a second. So we all graduated. Actually, that work, the, the discovery of that PFET injection led to two theses. And uh, the neuromorphic group, that was 97. We all scattered to the wind to go teaching at various places. And I ended up at the University of Washington, where I used some of this floating gate stuff to do signal processing. And I started to build some signal processing circuits. And it was about three years later, in the year 2000, I was going to be in the Bay Area. And I sent an email to Carver. And I said, you know, do you have any time to meet? And he said, yeah, let's get together. So flew down. Um, and I had dinner, dinner with Carver and Barb. And we talked about this work and how it was going great and all this kind of stuff. And I said. Carver, you know, this stuff's pretty cool. It works really well. At some point, someday, we should start a company. That's all I said. So I go back to the University of Washington. About three days later, I get an email. When are you going to be back down in the Bay Area? And it turned out I was flying back the next week. So flew back down. Carver, said, Carver replied. He said, come down a little bit early. Come down in time for lunch, and we'll spend the afternoon together. So I dutifully fly down 
early, get there in time for lunch, Carver picks me up. And he says, I got some people for you to meet. I said, really, Carver? He, I said, who? And he throws me the uh, Wall Street Journal. And I said, what? Carver, explain more. And he says, look, right there on the front. Um, Venture Law Group, the number one law group for funding startups. I said, OK. He said, we're going to meet with them this afternoon. I said, OK. And what are we going to do there, Carver? He said, you're going to give them your pitch. I said, Carver, what pitch? He said, and in all seriousness, he said, that's what we're going to figure out over lunch. So here I am, you know, a couple years out of school, not really prepared for this. We go into this room, these two high-powered attorneys come in, mahogany table, you know, it seemed like about as, as wide as this room. <laughs> and uh, Carver said, go for it. So I start talking, and now I'm talking and for an hour, and they're asking questions, and maybe we're in it for an hour and a half, and I, I have no idea how this is going. And then Carver turns to the attorneys and says, do you want to do it? And they say, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> So Carver says, I'm in for a certain amount. And they say, they're in for a certain amount. And they turn to me and Chris, they say, Chris, can you come up with you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars? I'm like, really? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I didn't say I don't know. I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so a company called Impinge, which is, a, which is a Impact Injection, got founded. And uh, they all went off, and I'm sitting in the room kind of staring around thinking, OK, what just happened here? And then the attorneys come back, and with a stack of documents, had to be about that high. Sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here. It's all the way to the bottom. They give me a couple of checks, and we walk out of the office. And I turned to Carver. I said, Carver, now what? He said, what do you mean, now what? Go hire some people, get some office space, get going. <laughs> so um, that little incident caused a slight change in my career plans. <laughs> But so we founded this company called Impinge. And uh, I'm going to go to the next slide here. So what the company Impinge, it, it took us a while to figure out a path going forward. But what the company makes is UHF, ultra high frequency, radio frequency identification, RFID circuits. And actually it makes RFID, an entire RFID technology suite. But I'm not going to go into the details of what it does, except to say that there are these integrated circuits. And we call them tag integrated circuits. Integrated circuit's about a half a millimeter on a side. It's tiny, but it's a full radio on a chip. I'll show you a picture in just a second. Um, and that full radio on a chip extracts energy from incoming RF, uses that energy to power itself up, and can respond to a reader. There's the little chip gets put down on a little antenna. Here's an example of one. They're about this size. That's just a little aluminum antenna on, on, on polyethylene or also on paper. Little tiny chip on it. And a one watt reader can read one of these, these, we call them tags or inlays, at about a 10 meter range. They cost a couple of pennies manufactured like this. Two readers in the, in the room here, one in the ceiling here and one in the ceiling over there, could read thousands of these things distributed all around the room. Can read them at about typically a couple hundred per second. Peak rate is about 1,000 per second. Each one carries a unique identifier. Readers in the room could identify each individual item to which one of these tags is attached where it is, and the authenticity of the item to which it's attached for a couple of pennies. I'll come back to that in just a, in just a second, say a, little bit, a few more words there. So we started building these things, and, you know, and it took a long time, a lot longer than I thought. We started the company in 2000. It's now 2014. I forgot to mention when we started the company, I asked Carver, I said, Carver, I'm a professor. You know? How long is this going to take? He said, oh, typical company, you know, you're there for 18 months, and then you spin it out, and everything's great, and then you go back to being a professor. <laughs> OK, well, 14 years later, actually 10 years in, I said, Carver, you remember that 18 months? He said, it never happens in 18 months. It always takes a long time, <laughs> a long time to start a good company. So I said, OK, shock that one up to experience. <laughs> um, but so we made these, these tag ICs and, and uh, little chips that go on the antennas and started selling them out there. And then we got a lot of customers who came and said they wanted to read tags that were on bottles of liquids, like for pharmaceutical products. 
And it turned out that was a pretty hard problem because it was just hard to read. The, the dielectric properties of the, the glass and the, and the liquid just made it really hard to read. And so we have a, an engineer, his name's Ron Oliver, a really good electromagnetics guy, Carver, and he huddled all the time. And uh, Ron found a, a really clever way to make a reader antenna that would allow reading tags on a liquid. And to do a demonstration, we did him a demonstration, as you can see here. We got a handful of these small tags, put them in a bottle of water. Actually, the way, all we did with these is we took the tags, we took some scotch tape, put it on each side to sort of protect it for a little while, dropped them in water, and, uh, and demonstrated that we could read tags underwater. And those tags have lasted for about five years underwater. Don't ask me how, but they have. And so Carver came in one day and saw this experiment with the ta reading the tags underwater, and he got so excited. And he got that aha look on his face again. And he ran off. And now I'm going to read Ron's words to you, because uh, Ron gave me a couple of notes for this event. So Carver's eyes lit up when he saw tags in water. He ran off, ran again, for a few hours and came back with a single sheet of paper filled with scribbled equations, deriving the operating conditions for the fields required to read tags underwater. I taped that page into my green book where it sits today. I still use that book on a regular basis. So Ron wanted to thank you for the book, for the, for the mapping a clear path through 150 years of classical physics wilderness to where people can understand, really have an intuitive understanding of the fundamental basis of electromagnetics. And uh, that book still informs a lot of the work we do at Impinge today. So I said I'd come back and say a couple of words about um, about the IC. So this is the IC that we're currently making today. You can see the size, 400 microns by 465 microns. It's tiny. It is truly a full radio on a chip. And it uses so much of Carver's lifetime of achievement. VLSI, obviously, and structure design methodologies. Floating gates in the memories and some other circuits inside. Incredibly low power. Almost all subthreshold. The electrodynamics work. It's just all based on the work Carver's done for so many years. And I think 20 years from now, when we look back, these kinds of circuits, these ultra-low power radios, will, 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 be a, 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 will really be fitting to, to really the work that Carver has done for so many years. Each IC, like I said, can identify, locate, and authenticate items in your everyday world. And the projections are, by the year 2020, there will be more than 20, I mean, 20 billion items in the physical world. And the idea, basically, is you can put tags on anything and locate where they are. And you can imagine a future where there's just tag stuff. And people have their mobile phones with readers on them. And as you walk around, it just crowdsources the locations of items. Each item has a unique identity. So essentially, it's the extension of the internet out to individual items, everyday items. Everyday items like stuff that's getting tagged today, which is if you go to a Macy's, store and you hold up the tag, you know, the price ticket, hold it up to light, you'll probably see an antenna inside. There's a tag inside there. Golf balls, if, you go, if you've ever heard of Top Golf, where it's a golf driving range, there's tags in the golf balls when they get tracked, how, how well you, you hit. In Coke freestyle machines and the syrup cartridges, in uh, marathon races, your bib that has a, has a, has a, has a tag in it to, to track your marathon time, and a whole bunch of other things. So the, Carver, the work that you're doing, if, even though it, even if it, you could say it's already gone everywhere today, it's going to go everywhere in, in our world. So, <clears throat> so I have, had, uh, I have had three great fortunes. One is to be in Carver's lab, and thank you for that, Carver. The second one is to, uh, to be able to co-found a company with Carver. And the third one is that a couple years ago, Carver moved up to Seattle. And he lives only about 30 minutes from my house. And that's the, that's the, that's the most wonderful thing, because I get to see him relatively often. Um, so I thought I'd close with just saying a, a couple of words as I think about Carver and all the things that he's done. But I, I think about kind of how he thinks about things. Um, I, I, Carver has tremendous faith in the universe, a faith in that physics is a way to describe the universe, that the universe makes sense if you just listen to it. And he, as, you, as many of you have heard, listen to the electrons, listen to the physics, listen to the wave function. And I think it's that trans tremendous faith in the universe that has led him to do the work he's doing and other current work we're going to hear about shortly about gravity. And Carver also has tremendous trust in people. I think all of us probably know that. We heard about it earlier today. Carver likes to give people resources and freedom and let them go. Trust that they'll do a good job. Trust them to do well. And the third thing is Carver is tremendously curious. Doesn't stop, keeps trying all the time. He always keeps looking to find a way. 
He tries to tackle the first order item first. Don't worry about all the details, all that kind of stuff. Get, get out in the lab, try the first order item first, get the first order term, and that first order term will tell you where to go next. Learn by trying, build it, and you'll find a path. So I wanted to close with one final picture. In 2003, a reporter from the Silicon Valley Biz Inc. did an interview with Carver, and one of the questions he asked was, why do you do what you do? And Carver's answer was, to make the world a better place. Carver, there's a picture of me at graduation with my family. And for me, and I know for a lot of people in this room, you've made the world a far better place. So thank you. Am I, am I on? Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and Mary Ellen is here back there. There she is. Um, nice picture. There. Um, he didn't, uh, Chris also has uh, the ability to, his memory is good enough that he remembers things that, that didn't happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, um, what, what really happened was he, uh, I wasn't taking any more grad students, and, and this guy kept calling. <laughs> and um, one time Donna caught me in the lab and said, you know, this guy has been calling, you know, for weeks. <laughs> and, and then Donna, Donna's an incredible, uh, has incredible sense for people, and she said, you know, I think you'd like this guy. <laughs> and I said, okay, uh, schedule dinner at uh, Raymond and we'll, I'll meet him there. So, so Chris came over and we had dinner and I said, what are you doing? I, well, he's working at TRW. And I said, well, what do you do at TRW? Well, um, he'd been an engineer there, but then he was, um, they had gotten to where, the way it works at TRW, of course, they go to put a big system together and, and all the pieces work, but the system never works. <laughs> and then somebody has to figure it out. So what they do, they put together a tiger team. And they have found, found out that Chris was the best guy they could find who would find the best people and go in and figure out what was really in and fix it. So he told me about some of the stories about what he'd done. And I looked at him, I said, that sounds like a great life why do you want to go back to school? He said, they threatened to make me a manager. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's, that, that, that's true. Uh, okay, happy 80th, Carver. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs>